Good morning. I am Dr. Michelle Fannin-Steele, and I am coming to you today from the headquarters of Deergo Food Safety here in beautiful Yarmouth, Maine. It is a beautiful day here. The sun is shining, and we've got clean food and clean water to drink, and so it's a great day. I am coming to you today because we are doing Deergo Food Safety office hours, and we've gotten several questions over the course of the week, and so I thought I would come to you live today with a brief presentation to talk about HACCP and what it means and um, what we mean when we're talking about it, because sometimes we're all saying the same word and we mean different things. <laughs> and then I'll be, I'll be answering questions. Um, this is a live office hours, and so if you have questions, everybody who's participating, by all means, put them in the comments box. And um, I've gotten uh, questions over email. You can always submit questions over email for these live office hours. I've gotten questions over emails, which I will address at the end of the presentation. So you can see on my, um, on my uh, uh, <laughs> paper behind me on my gigantic sticky note, which I love, uh, what we're going to talk about today. And so what I want to address, because I, spent, I feel like I spent a lot of time clearing this up, uh, is what is HACCP and like what does it mean? Okay, so there are actually a whole bunch of different kinds of HACCPs out there. HACCP is a food safety planning system, okay? But depending on who's regulating you or who's auditing you or whatever, it can actually mean different things. So when we talk meat and poultry, when we're talking about slaughtering things uh, and amenable species, like if you are uh, in the meat and poultry world, you have what we call USDA HACCP. USDA HACCP is in Title IX of the Code of Federal Regulation. If you are having trouble sleeping tonight, by all means, go and read it. Uh, and the HACCP regulation under USDA uh, came out in 1996. We call it the mega reg, but it's but one part of the rules that you have to abide by if you are producing under USDA. There's a whole bunch of other things that um, are not actually HACCP, okay? There's sanitation regulations, which is not HACCP. Those are SSOPs, uh, recall planning, allergen planning, good manufacturing practices. All of that is outside the context of HACCP. And what I want to present to everybody today is actually this idea that when we are doing food safety planning, there's actually... Um, a whole set of things that we have to do, of which HACCP is kind of the actually the last thing. So the first one is education and training, all right? We have to go get education and training so that we know what we're doing. The next thing is what we call GMPs and prerequisite programs. All right, so that's like your facilities and allergen control is a prerequisite program, um, uh, recall is a prerequisite program, preventative maintenance, your sanitation SOPs, those are all prereq programs. So we call those PRP, okay? You have to do your education and training so you know what you're doing. You have to write your good manufacturing practices and your prereq programs, and only then, <laughs> Only then do we get to HACCPs. HACCPs are the top of the pyramid and we write them last. And the reason we do that is because in all of these different kinds of HACCPs, by and large, there's an exception over in fish, GMPs and your prerequisite programs make hazards not reasonably likely to occur. If your hazards are not reasonably likely to occur, then you don't have to control for them. And HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis for Critical Control Points. We are looking for ways we control physical, chemical, microbial hazards, okay? If you want to go through HACCP training, I have one. I'll, there's a link on the page. I'll post a link in the comments. But the vast majority of the work that you are going to do in a food-related business that is covered by a HACCP program is actually in good manufacturing practices and prerequisite programs, all right? And you should spend as much or more time making sure those prerequisite programs are working, okay? And that's a requirement under USDA HACCP, 
All right, so that's USDA HACCP. That is, of course, regulated by FSIS, the Food Safety Inspection Service of the USDA. The next one that I want to talk about is uh, the JUICE HACCP program. So JUICE HACCP came to us after a bunch of people got sick with shigatoxin E. coli from unpasteurized juice. And JUICE HACCP is, um, is it 21 CFR? I don't remember. Um, but JUICE HACCP is uh, how we have to do HACCP planning in um, when we make juice products. Any and all non-alcoholic juice products require a juice HACCP plan, okay? Juice HACCP plans look an awful lot like USDA HACCP plans, okay? There are 12 steps to HACCP. I'll get that to that in a little bit when we talk about Codex HACCP. There are 12 steps to HACCP. In USDA HACCP and juice HACCP, you have to document all your 12 steps, okay? And the 12 steps are uh, forming your food safety team, describing your product, describing your intended user, diagramming your process flow, verifying your process flow, doing a hazard analysis, setting critical control points, setting critical limits, okay? And then there is monitoring associated with those critical limits, verification, validation, record keeping, and maintaining your HACCP, okay? We go through all of those in the HACCP training, um, and I don't want to belabor the point, but in USDA and JUICE HACCP, you must have documented evidence of all 12 of those steps, okay? Now, fisheries HACCP. There is a huge resurgence in value-added fisheries. People are understanding that fish is not a commodity product. Local fishermen um, really have, you know, value in our communities. I mean, I live on the coast of Maine. You know, um, coastal, coastal fishing communities are real, and they deserve to, you know, be able to do value-added products and, and make money off of it. So in the fisheries realm, which is, you know, um, um, any any live animal that comes out of the ocean, by and large, um, but you know, fin fish, lobsters, crustace, you know, other crustaceans, shell stock, um, turtles, and alligators actually uh, are regulated by the fisheries HACCP. They actually only fish not regulated by fisheries HACCP, and uh, there are political reasons behind this. Is catfish? So if you are watching this and you do catfish, you are actually regulated under USDA HACCP. <laughs> How's that? So anyway, but for everybody else <laughs> who's doing fish kinds of things or alligators or turtles, but not kelp, okay? I'll talk about kelp in just a second. Um, you're regulated under fisheries HACCP. And here's the fun part, is that in fisheries, when we talk about HACCP planning, we don't mean anything like we mean in juice and uh, USDA HACCP. In fisheries HACCP, the only thing that is required to be written down is what we generally refer to in, in regular HACCP, if you will, um, is the CCP documentation. What step does the hazard you're controlling for occur? What hazard are you controlling for? And how are you controlling for it? What's the monitoring step? What are the corrective actions? Uh, and what are the ver what's the uh, verification, validation, and record keeping? In fisheries, we have one validation document by and large, and that's the fisheries hazard guide, okay? And that simultaneously makes everything a lot easier and a lot harder, because if it's not in the hazard guide, you can't do it. All right, and that, and, and so it's, so fisheries HACCPs are, are rather more straightforward, I guess, <laughs> um, but they can be more complicated because, uh, because of the way the FDA has decided to regulate them. Okay, so if you are talking to other people in the local food industry um, and they say, I have a fisheries HACCP, it is going to look nothing like your HACCP. It is going to seem woefully incomplete. You don't have to write down your hazard analysis in a fisheries HACCP. Now, I'm not 100% sure how you get to CCPs without writing down a hazard analysis, but I'm not the one that wrote the law. Okay, so that's fisheries HACCP. Okay, then the next place we all run into trouble is what we call with food code HACCP. So the food code is the retail food code. It has nothing to do with the Department of Agriculture in your state or federally, okay? The food code is rewritten every two years at the federal level uh, where they just released the 2017 food code. And next month down in Richmond, Virginia, the Conference for Food Protection is going to meet and write the next version of the food code. 
And they keep writing the word HACCP into the food code. But the problem is, is that the HACCP planning in the food code is not actually HACCP planning. So HACCP planning uh, is that, as, as most of us think about it, if you think about hazard analysis for critical control points, is, is, is you have to analyze and figure out what your critical control points are. In the food code, as promulgated by almost every single state in the union, um, or the sometimes your food codes, depending on where you are, are regulated by your county, they tell you what your critical control points are. They call it a HACCP plan, but they tell you what your critical control points are. This makes it not a HACCP plan, okay? But we use that language because that's the language that they want to use, all right? So if you are writing, if you are in a retail setting and writing food code HACCP, Packaging, packaging of raw food or of sous vide grating. Okay, so you want to sous vide in your restaurant. That's totally acceptable. Most food codes have now been adapted to allow sous vide cooking. Okay, but don't kid yourself. You can't actually write a HACCP plan. You must use the critical control points that the um, that, that your that your food code says, and those critical control points on what state and sometimes depending on what county. Okay, I write critical control points for different counties in the same state in HACCP plans. And for one of them, we can have a critical control point of the temperature of the refrigerator. And on the other side of the state, the critical control point is the temperature of the product like before and after it's been vacuum packed. And so we have, if somebody wants to come to Maine and to the floor downstairs and buy me a beer, we can have a whole entire discussion of what risks we're actually controlling when we keep all of our food cold and we vacuum pack it and we can't agree like where the actual critical control point is and therefore from a scientific perspective, maybe it's not a critical control point. Uh, that's the way the world gets right? so if you are one of the things that makes it really hard is having an issue with the sound thanks for thanks for telling me uh, let me move my I wonder what's going on um do to do to do maybe if i move this out of my pocket <laughs> okay um is that better amy thanks okay all right sunspots solar flares <laughs> okay so anyway um if you are a chef and um, you are talking with other chefs and you're like looking at each other's paperwork because that's, you know, like, I mean, we're all professionals and we share information when, you know, we're sitting down and having, um, sit, sitting down and having beer and stuff like that. Um, you can't actually, um, I don't want to say copy, but, but your friends has it planned for their, for their ROP packaging may not have anything to do with your own food code. Okay. And that's, I, I, again, buy me a beer. We can have a long conversation about it. But so that's food code HACCP. It can actually be a whole lot more confusing, mostly because the health and human services side tends to have significantly less training than the Department of Agriculture side. Okay, they are always the last people to be able to sign up for HACCP classes. And there are few things in the world more challenging to work with than an untrained inspector. They're all generally good people. They're not trying to put you out of business. There's just no money for training um, food code inspectors on HACCP, and it's really pretty challenging. And actually, I have offered to go in and train people for free. <laughs> and so if you have a food inspector, um, they, can, they can take my HACCP classes for free. I will, I will underwrite that because I find it so important to my clients to have inspectors who know what they're talking about. And if I train them, then hopefully they know what they're talking about. Okay, so that's food code HACCP. Now I want to talk about Codex HACCP. Okay, so Codex uh, is the is a subsection of the Food Safety Inspection Service in the USDA. Okay, and Codex writes what we call Codex HACCP, and they're the ones that um, uh, work to 
ensure that food safety planning in America is equal to food safety planning in our trading partners. And we do that by having what's called Codex HACCP, where everybody is looking at the same set of documentation across international boundaries so that we can import food back and forth. Okay, um, this is incredibly important. Um, you know, we're in the middle of, we're, we're on the precipice of a trade war with China, and it is going to have dramatic, dramatic effects in rural America. Um, and it, there is the potential for food safety to be used as a weapon in the trade war, and that's going to be pretty horrible for everybody. Okay, so that's Codex HACCP. Now, if you need a third party audit, almost every single third party audit is based on code on Codex HACCP. So back when I was doing audits, and I'm not doing them anymore, but I would audit, audit to a Codex standard because this Codex standard is the standard, okay? And it normalizes having to understand USDA HACCP, juice HACCP, and fish HACCP for the auditor. If everybody is expected to document and go through all 12 steps of HACCP, then, everybody's on the same page and the auditors can all take the same questions and same documentation into different facilities and it makes auditing a repeatable scalable business okay and so if you need a food safety audit for your clients it's going to be to a codex standard okay and that codex standard is the 12 steps of HACCP I'll post it it's on my web page um, where we again we start with naming our food safety team and we end up with implementing the HACCP and all the record keeping that sort of thing okay but if you're getting a third-party audit you're not just going to be audited on your HACCP plan okay because your HACCP plan is also dependent on your good manufacturing practices and your prerequisite programs so your audit will by and large be for both I will not do a HACCP audit without doing a GMP audit I can do a GMP audit all by itself okay it is not dependent on HACCP okay and then finally before we get to questions uh, what I want to talk about is uh, our new and fun preventive controls rule which the USDA will or not the USDA the FDA will tell you is not HACCP by heavens it is not HACCP my friends however the steps of writing a preventive control plan are name your food safety team describe your product describe your um, intended consumer, draw a process flow diagram, do a hazard analysis, and then determine any preventive controls or critical control points. Okay, then you have to do monitoring, and then you have to do record keeping, and I mean, it's all the same thing, except now they have taken this idea that we actually have over in fisheries HACCP, which we have, um, uh, GMPs and um, prerequisite programs control for hazards. So I said at the top of the hour, preventative, con or preventive controls, um, prerequisite programs and good manufacturing practices create the conditions to create safe food. They make hazards not reasonably likely to occur. Under fisheries HACCP and under preventive controls under FSMA, you can use those programs as what we call preventive controls and they can control for hazards all right the easiest way to think about this is that if you are doing ready to eat foods you cannot have listeria in your ready to eat foods in america there is a zero tolerance in europe there's 10 colony forming units per gram tolerance but in america there's zero and most of the way in local food and in small food production we have um, listeria control through sanitation and you truly are controlling it all right and so in a fisheries HACCP you can say I'm controlling for listeria and my ready to eat lobster by my sanitation program in preventive controls you are controlling for listeria in your um, ready to eat pies or whatever um, through a sanitation preventive control okay so it's a little down in the weeds with that and don't and don't worry about it if you are doing preventive controls plans if you are a small business by the way you have um until september to be writing preventive uh to writing and enacting preventive controls plan they have to be live and ready to go for september this year okay um if you are writing preventive controls plans you have to go take the you have to go take the class i offer it you know get in touch with me i'm happy to teach it um i do private classes here in the office um but 
it's really good to think that by and large, your prerequisite programs have to be so solid that in your HACCP plan, you are really controlling for things that you cannot otherwise control for. Okay, and that's what HACCP planning is. It's for critical control points. It's not for the things that never happen, okay? Most of the time when things go wrong, they go wrong in your GMP program and your prerequisites. If you're doing things right, you're not missing your critical limits. You're not missing your monitoring. I mean, it happens, but, you know, you, you, you figure it out and you drive on. But when things go wrong, things don't get cleaned, okay? Your HACCP is predicated on things getting cleaned. <laughs> that's how we make most hazards not reasonably likely to occur. Preventative maintenance, that's how how we prevent physical hazards, okay? Um, that's how you prevent your facility from falling into your food is through preventative maintenance, <laughs> okay? That's a prerequisite program. It's not in your HACCP program, okay? So that's the general difference. That's HACCP, HACCP, and HACCP, and what we mean when we, when we say HACCP uh, depends on who you're regulated by. Now, the next question, which is going to lead me into one of the questions I got over email, which was... Um, about cooling steps. So in most production, if you cook, you also have to cool. If you are killing animals, you have to take the animals, you know, whether it's a lobster or a crab or, or a cow, um, from their body temperature, which is generally 90 to 100 degrees, kind of depending, um, down to below uh, your target temperature, which in is in the neighborhood of 40 degrees. Okay, that takes a certain amount of time. Those are generally critical limits, okay? Um, but then, once things are below 40 degrees, it's quality, not safety, okay? There are no time measurements for how long something has to, uh, to freeze, all right? In poultry, uh, it's not frozen until it's below 26 degrees anyway, and so they're, they're not going to, you can ship it at 26 degrees and say it's fresh. So if you are cooling things off, all you have to do is get it below 40. If then you want to take it from 40 to 20 to 0 to negative 10 to whatever it is that you want, um, there are no time constraints on that because that's quality, not safety. And I want to make the point that when we're writing HACCP plans, we don't write in quality steps. I mean, the, the reason we do process flow diagramming is so that you know what you are doing and you can understand the hazards of what you're doing. But you do all of those steps because it makes your product your product. You know, how you mix things, whether or not you add ice to your batter, or whether, you know, how often you fold your dough or what all those, um, all those good sorts of things. That is, um, all those considerations are really, really important and I don't want to discount them but they don't go into your HACCP plan because HACCP is for food safety only, okay? And so if you're, the, dis, the distinction between cooling and freezing is quality, not safety, okay? And that can be said of a lot of different things. Once you cook something, this is, there's a common uh, in poultry, you know, salmonella is killed in poultry at 165 degrees, on an instant read thermometer, okay? You stick it in, it reads 165, you know the salmonella is dead. Well, culturally here in America, we eat our poultry at 185 degrees. I've had chicken cooked to 165 degrees. I don't like it, okay? We cook chicken to 185 degrees. But that 20 degree difference between 165 and 185, one is cultural and two, is quality, not safety, because the salmonella is not more dead at 185 degrees than it was at 165 degrees. Okay, so when you're writing your HACCP plans, remember, safety, not quality. What physical things can go wrong, what microbial things can go wrong, and what chemical things can go wrong. And remember, this one's always hard for people to remember, allergens are chemicals. Okay, so we treat them as, as chemicals because of reasons that kind of surpass understanding to me and don't really go with the pathophysiology of um, how this all works, but whatever, allergens are chemical hazards. Okay, so um, I will, uh, we've got five minutes till the top of the hour. I am happy to entertain any and all questions around HACCP or otherwise, um, and I will be, um, I'll be here and I'll be checking the, um, I'll be checking the live feed.
um, if you want to ask me uh, any questions out there. And if not, we can all go have another cup of coffee and pray. So <laughs> I'll give everybody a few more minutes. All righty. It looks like we're not going to get too many more questions. Um, if you think of some while you're uh, uh, having that second cup of coffee, um, by all means, uh, post it in the post it in the newsfeed, and we'll uh, we'll get it. Uh, we'll get it to you. I will post some URLs that I refer to uh, in the live feed, and I hope everybody has a great Saturday, or I guess a great Friday, <laughs> and a great weekend. Um, it's been delightful having you all, and uh, look for more office hours. Probably uh, I'm doing them maybe um, uh, earlier in the week next week, um, but later in the day, just to kind of adjust for adjust for times, because our our friends on the West Coast are all um, still in their first cup of coffee. <laughs> Have a great day. Have a great weekend, everybody.